So good morning, everyone. It's really an honor to be here, and I was thrilled when uh, Nathan reached out and said, can you please come and, and speak to the, the association? So it is true, Nathan and I went to law school together, we passed law school to, together, and I've, I've had a career that I didn't expect. I don't think any of us grow up thinking, oh, when I grow up, I'm gonna be a cannabis lawyer, <laughs> let alone you know, being called in Namibia, and two points to anyone who knows where that is. Um, so I was asked to just give an overview of cannabis law. Um, it really could be a whole day seminar because it touches so many things. But I think given the different types of practices in the room, cannabis can touch your, to touch your area of practice. Um, so I think it is something that's good to have an overview of. So who here is doing um, criminal law? Okay, great. Who here does corporate law? Real estate? Litigation? Insurance, family, <laughs> and then there's also administrative. I mean, there's lots of other types of law uh, that cannabis can touch, but I mean, the whole room will have cannabis um, infiltrated in some sort of way. So the title of my uh, practice, from a professional sense, um, the title of my uh, presentation today is Into the Weeds, an Overview of Cannabis and the Law. So I was recently a general counsel at a publicly traded company called New Strike, um, and now I'm on my own, so I'd love to talk with the solo and small practitioners about practice tips and tricks as I'm uh, starting out this year. Um, so my corporation is called Chun Law Professional Corporation, and I'm here to talk about cannabis. And I think it's really remarkable, it's probably a moment in time today that this association is having a cannabis talk at its, uh, at its annual meeting. Um, and I think that's really exciting. So as a lawyer um, and as legal practitioners, to see the law evolve and change and to see legalization happen is really exciting. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be part of that and to hopefully spark some conversation today too. So I'm gonna go over the history, laws, various regulators, risk compliance, and practice areas. And hopefully my aim is to have the various topics I touch on perhaps have some sort of overlap with what you do in your day-to-day -day and how you advise your clients. So who am I? So Nathan gave me an update on, on who I am. So I was general counsel at New Strike Brands, um, which was partnered with a band called The Tragically Hip. Um, and they had a, a licensed producer company called Up Cannabis. Uh, we were part of the first testing of the, of the takeover rules, which were changed in 2016. Uh, we had a friendly merger with a company called Canamed, and then a little company called Aurora Cannabis came and uh, did an over-the-top hostile takeover. As a lawyer, it was super exciting because I got to sit in the front row of the Ontario Securities Commission while they were hearing the pleadings, and my CEO was sitting beside me saying, when can I go? And I said, well, you have to at least, at least listen to our submissions. But for me as a lawyer, it was really exciting to see the various sides and to see what happened with that case. And that case is cited by M&A lawyers in terms of takeover rules and the, and the 30 or 105 day period. Um, so we did lots of financings. What happened was uh, there was a headline called Left at the Altar But Not for Long. So it was three companies, Aurora, Canamed, and New Strike, who were all uh, trying to merge or figuring out how they were gonna have this bizarre love triangle. Um, but at the end of the day, after two sleepless nights and rounds of negotiation, my company walked away with a $9.5 million termination fee, which was the keep the ring fee, and then the other two companies went on and, and merged. Um, on that same day, so we press released at 10 a.m. that we terminated. By 3.30, we had a $92 million bot deal. So we were left at the altar, but not, not for long, and then we geared up for uh, recreational cannabis. So all that to say, legalization happened, we operationalized the company, um, and then finally, we exited the company to a company called Hexo. So Hexo was a Quebec-based licensed producer. It was a friendly deal, and we exited in March. I stayed on, or, sorry, in May. I stayed on for part of the summer, and then um, now I'm here with you today. So that's my background. And prior to that, I did was a partner at a big law firm overseas and did corporate commercial law for oil and gas and uh, mining companies. Also did some financial services. So we're gonna go a little bit over the history of cannabis. So cannabis started to be regulated in Canada in 1923 when it was added to the Opium and Narco Narcotic Control Act. And then there was a bunch of case law that happened. The whole basis of how legalization happened in cannabis, in Canada, not cannabis, um, was through the medical regime. So 
cannabis is, was, the genesis of cannabis legalization was cannabis as medicine. So we look at the R.V. Parker case in 1999-2000. It held that individuals with a medical need had the right to possess marijuana for medical purposes, and they had a constitutional right to use medical cannabis. So that really opened the door, and that's really the common law right for people to have access to cannabis as medicine. That evolved to the, the uh, laws actually being made, the 2001 Medical Marijuana Access Regulations, or the MMARs, you might hear people use that acronym, granted legal access to cannabis for individuals with HIV and AIDS and other illnesses. So this was the official medical regime being born. In 2013, the MMPR was born, which is the Medical Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulations. So medical marijuana access rules changed, shifting to licensed commercial growers. So before it was individuals or individuals who assigned other people to grow for them. Now we actually have what's called licensed producers or, um, or corporates who would grow the cannabis. Um, and some 37,800 people authorized to possess marijuana under the federal program, up from fewer than 100 in 2001. So there was really an evolution of, of medical cannabis. In 2015, the Supreme Court in R.B. Smith decided that restricting legal access to only dried marijuana was unconstitutional, and the right to use and create other forms of cannabis was allowed. So dried marijuana is, um, is the smokable flower, if you will. I won't give you a how-to lesson, I'm just going to go through the format. Um, but as a medicine, there are, not everyone is comfortable with that format of ingestion. Um, so oils and edibles, tinctures, those were now allowed through the R.B. Smith case. And when I start talking about Cannabis 2.0, which is the amendments to the act to allow for edibles, uh, concentrates, and topicals, that's just the um, expansion of the product formats of cannabis in Canada. The Allard case was also very important in 2016 held that uh, requiring individuals to get marijuana from only licensed producers violated their liberty and security rights protected by Section 7 of the Charter, and also found that individuals requiring marijuana for medical purposes did not have reasonable access. And then in 2016, the Access to Cannabis for Medical Purposes Regulations was born, and that's the, the real regime for licensed producers, the ACMPR. Now, on, in October, on October 17th, um, the Cannabis Act was born, which allows for recreation, recreational cannabis federally and provinces are responsible for retail channels of cannabis. So that means that adult use cannabis or the OCS or on, um, purchasing of adult use non-medicinal cannabis, that was the regime for that. And in 2019, um, October 17th, was when amendments were made to the regulations to allow for uh, edibles, topicals, and tinctures. So um, if anyone has come across edible cannabis, not as a consumer, but just generally, has anyone heard of uh, cannabis gummies, right? Or, or their grandma who uses THC cream for their arthritis? Um, all of that stuff, unless it's from the medical channel with the topicals, is actually not lawful because it was only legalized on October 17th of this year, and then there's a 60-day approval period from Health Canada to approve any new product formats. So the first legal Cannabis Act, um, edibles, topicals, and concentrates will actually only come to market in just before Christmas time. Um, whether they will is another... <laughs> Santa is coming. Whether... <laughs> May Christmas dinner be interesting this year. Um, whether they'll actually get to shelves is a whole other story, but there have been thousands of new SKUs, new products submitted to Health Canada as of October 17th um, in anticipation for this. And the whole goal of why, you know, we're, why the different types of formats are being allowed is to support one of the four pillars of why the Cannabis Act exists. One is to eradicate the black market. Um, and, this, and that'll make all the criminal lawyers' jobs easier, hopefully. Uh, the second is to keep it away from, from children, to have safe access, um, and to have a, a regulator, so Health Canada. Okay, so why the law? So as I mentioned, the law touches on many, many, cannabis touches many aspects of the law and vice versa. So law re regulates the plant, so the actual marijuana plant in terms of who can cultivate, distribute, and sell. People, who can do what with it? Um, and regulating impairment, so uh, what happens to people who actually consume cannabis. And then the government, so whether it's imposing taxes or regulations. And it's not just regulations in terms of Health Canada. A lot of these cannabis companies are publicly listed on the stock market. And I hope for those of you that held stocks, you got out early enough before the decline. Um, 
so, so cannabis is being regulated in various different spheres. Licensing. So there was a time a long time ago, i.e. a couple of years ago, when having an, a cannabis uh, production license meant that the capital markets, fairy, fairy dust would be sprinkled and all of a sudden, boom, you'd be a public company and, and ever would be a success overnight. Um, that's not the case anymore, and there's actually several different types of licenses that you can get under the Cannabis Act. They are cultivation, so that's to actually grow in a facility. Processing, so that's the ability to be able to extract oils or to create different formats like capsules. Um, analytical testing, so there's a whole different um, subset for uh, labs that actually test to see the potency of the cannabis, whether there's pesticides or, or other undesirables, undesir pardon me, in the, in the uh, cannabis. A sales license, so just because you can, are permitted to grow does not mean that you have the ab ability to sell. It's a second type of licensing regime that happens. And same with oils, you may be able to process cannabis into oil, but you need a second license to be able to sell that oil in that format. And then importantly, there's a research license. So I, this is my personal pet project, is research licenses for cannabis. Because as you know, cannabis, Canada is the first G7 country to legalize cannabis, both medically and recreationally. And I'm not sure that we will maintain our first mover advantage in the world because we're not innovating or having patents or uh, sufficient research to really move cannabis into like a, a regular medical form or, or um, other type of CPG product. Um, and research licenses from what I'm hearing from clients is, are taking a really long time. So McGill is a very well-known research university and they're sitting on 11 months plus of trying to get a research license just to conduct research. And if that's the, the backlog that they're getting in trying to find data and find science, I think that's going to be problematic. So um, my personal views on research licenses. And then the other one is a cannabis drug license. So if you're, you are trying to um, do a dinnable drug that is cannabis based. So what do you need for a license? Before you only needed to submit various paperwork um, to Health Canada and then you could apply for a license, you would get you wouldn't have to build anything, you just have to have all the, all the paperwork satisfied, and then you'd get what's called a, a letter to build, and so that would be like your, your permit to go ahead and build your facility, and then you could raise money, build your facility, and off you would go and get licensed. That's not the case anymore. So uh, there are high barriers to entry to enter the cannabis market as a grower, and Health Canada um, confirmed that when they changed the licensing process. So now you actually need to build the site, and then you get licensed. So you put up all, millions of dollars in CapEx. I mean, to do an indoor grow facility, it's, it's millions in HVAC and lights and, and, um, and irrigation, all of those things. You have to build all of that first in the hope and apply for a license that only once Health Canada approves do you get your license. So it's a, it's a very uh, high risk, high barrier to entry uh, requirement. So you build your site, um, you get it inspected, you've got security, municipal sec uh, clearances and good production practices in place. So if you work with your municipalities, how many, how many work with municipalities here in the room? Right, so some of you might have issues with, do you want to zone uh, an area in your municipality to allow for a grow operation or do you want to allow for retail? So there are considerations. Um, for cannabis facilities that grow indoors, they're a big draw on energy, but they're also good job producers. So there are lots of policy considerations there. Uh, what else you need for licenses? is the cannabis tracking licensing system. So what that is, is now Health Canada manages all of the data for each licensee online. Um, they're still working out the wrinkles, I think, because it isn't as efficient as we thought it would be. Um, but it's part of the whole concept of seed to sale tracking. So what that means is you want to know, I mean, we talk about chain of custody in criminal law. Um, seed to sale tracking is knowing, Health Canada knowing, where, where was the genesis of this plant? What was its life journey in terms of um, growing, uh, growing to processing to sale? And then where did it go? And why, why Health Canada needs to know, th know that is so there isn't, um, an, there isn't an influx of black market cannabis being mixed in, which happened with the Bonafide facility uh, uh, earlier this year, and also for recalls. So if there's ever a product recall, you wanna be able to trace where the product was and to be able to call it back and, and keep consumers safe. And then you need an application, patience, and lots of capital to, to get a license. 
Okay, cannabis 2.0. So that's the lingo that people in the industry are using. So whenever you're talking to cannabis folk, you can say cannabis 2.0. That's the, the new amendments that happened on October 17, 2019 for edibles, topicals, and tinctures. Um, so we went over that already. It's great that they're expanding the different types of cannabis formats. I think for lawyers, it's gonna be interesting too. Um, I was at a cannabis law summit two, two, almost three years ago, and then a litigator came in for one of the last sessions, and I just thought, well, there's not really much going on right now. Like, we're just licensing and producing. But now, product liability. Product liability, I think, is going to be in a burgeoning um, area of the law, as now there are new formats. I mean, I have a five-year-old, and if there's a packet of gummies, he will ingest the entire packet of gummies um, out of curiosity and, and greed. Um, and same with... <laughs> And I, I think we've already had black market gummies be ingested by accident by children in, in um, Nova Scotia or New Brunswick last year that happened and the, the child had to be taken to the hospital. Um, is it reasonably foreseeable that a child is going to want to eat chocolate or candy? Of course, of course it is. So um, I think for insurance clients that you might have, um, making sure that they're, that they're comfortable with what kind of cover that they're giving. And then from a product liability standpoint, I think it could be very, very interesting. And then these are the edible regulations. What you really need to know from here is that the maximum potency that you can have of THC, THC being the, um, the part of cannabis that gets you high, so it's the psychoactive ingredient, CBD being the um, anti-inflammatory uh, property of the plant. So the maximum THC content is uh, 10 milligrams. And often you'll see on the black market uh, products like the gummies or chocolates, you'll see like 100 or 250 milligrams. Canada is limiting each package to, to 10. And so I do do teaching at some of the colleges and universities and one of the students said, 10 milligrams? I'm not gonna buy 25 packs to actually get some sort of an effect. So I don't, <laughs> I don't know in terms of usurping the black market whether or not you know having the 10 milligrams per pack is, is a good entry point, but I think in terms of, of opening the market up slowly and safely, it's probably the best route to go. And then in terms of the economy, I mean, this was not at all whispered or even talked about at, on, at the recent federal election, even though Trudeau talked about it his last campaign. Um, it, it, is, it is a contributor to the economy. Um, and with the edibles market, Deloitte is predicting that edibles will be 1.6 billion and the edibles and alternatives market, so topicals and, and, and um, concentrates is about 2.7 billion. So there is a lot of, uh, of uh, there is a big market to be, to be had. Immigration, does anyone do immigration law? Well, I'll just, I'll just skip over this in, ter in case um, anybody has, has fears of crossing the US border with respect to cannabis. So this was really more of a story last year where uh, the US, U.S. Customs Border Patrol had a concern that if you invested in cannabis, so maybe you had a mutual fund that had a, had exposure in the high risk section to cannabis, or worked in the cannabis industry, um, that they could stop you, put you into secondary, and then flag you. Um, I did have an executive who was going to um, going to Seattle from Vancouver, and he was stopped and pulled into secondary, and we're still trying to get his uh, DHS trip application completed, which is to remove that flag on his file. Um, so the US Customs and Border Patrol has, uh, has, has watered down their position, and they've said now that anyone who is actually working in the cannabis industry, going to the US to conduct cannabis business, which is federally illegal, then they'll pull you over. But not simply because you work in the cannabis industry, advise cannabis clients, or invest in the industry. So that's, that's progress. And then of course there's the, whatever's happening in the US with um, legalization. It's being legalized state by state, so all the companies within the U.S. who are operating are vertically integrated because you can't, because of interstate, uh, you can't have interstate flow of cannabis. Um, they're all vertically integrated, growing, selling all of the business uh, state by state. And then the U.S. Farm Bill allowed for U.S. Uh, hemp-derived CBD to be allowed federally. So we'll see what happens whether, um, uh, when cannabis is federally legalized in the U.S. Okay, so litigation, we already talked about product liability, which I think will be interesting. Um, there's already a, 
a growing number of class actions in terms of securities law. All, all the c cannabis companies that are dual listed on Toronto and NASDAQ, uh, part of having access to uh, capital in New York also means that you have access to their litigious culture. So there are class actions against most of the um, NASDAQ listed companies. Um, and then director liability. I mean, if you followed CanTrust, which was uh, a can unfortunate cannabis scandal that happened over the summer, um, director liability is an issue for those of you advising uh, directors individually. Uh, one consideration that they should always have is do you have enough DNO insurance? Because uh, obtaining DNO insurance for uh, directors in cannabis has been very difficult. Labor and employment. Um, so when cannabis was legalized, there was a bunch of seminars on like how to, can how to introduce cannabis policy into your workplace. So it is a good point to bring up with all of your clients, corporate clients who, um, who, who come to you for labor and employment advice. So advising them on having a policy, basically it's the same as your anti-intoxication policy. You would just add a piece for cannabis and then add a line for accommodation of those who are medical cannabis users. Um, and then there are lots of jobs in cannabis, so talent and recruitment, that's definitely a, a growing area. And then compliance, so industry-specific compliance, de depending on what your, your, who your clients are. And it's also an opportunity. Real estate. So for our, our real estate uh, practitioners here in the room, landlord and tenant. So as a landlord, you may not want to have the four plants that each adult is allowed to grow to be grown in your condo or in your townhouse or in the home that you're renting. So that's something that you may want to work with your clients to put into a lease amendment for the next, next round. Same with condominiums. Um, so I was on a, on a cannabis panel on October 17th and at my previous company I was called the fun police because I would, I would tell the marketing team like, well, that's a great idea but you're not allowed to do that. Or I was the, the fun police because I tell the CEO, well, you can't say that and that's inconsistent and that's improper disclosure, so don't say that. But the real fun police was um, the condominium lawyer who was on the panel. So condos have bylaws and he would be advising um, boards of trustees for condos on how to make their, their cannabis bylaws. So things on restricting um, growing, like prohibited prohibiting it outright or in terms of consumption, uh, forbidding things like vaping uh, due to the smell, all of those things. Um, and even though they are covered by nuisance in the bylaws, um, he, he, he has quite a practice with helping condo boards to prohibit and restrict uh, cannabis use in, in their condos. And then purchase and sale agreements. So you'll see that the cannabis industry is under pressure financially and um, I was on a different panel a couple of weeks ago and somebody asked me, what are your biggest concerns for the industry next year? And I said, cash, because you know, cash is king is the saying, but cash is cash and people are, and companies are running out. So what you are gonna be seeing is there are gonna be um, a sale of assets probably, and they're now cannabis REITs coming out with, with uh, REITs looking to, to soak up um, distressed cannabis assets and then lease them back to their original vendors. So I think that's an, an area of growth or opportunity. Um, and then mortgages. So people are gonna be take, uh, asking for secure debt to, to fund their activities. Um, oh, and the criminal, I didn't put in my criminal law slide. So for criminal law, and there are criminal lawyers in the room, for criminal law, there are um, pardons that may be done for minor uh, cannabis possession charges, but expungements is something that hasn't really uh, taken off in terms of that happening on a, on a massive scale. So I think that's an area that could be an opportunity for lawyers. Um, and then also enforcement just with the various new um, criminal, cr criminal uh, laws and standards. So that is it for me in a nutshell. So I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you and I'd love to entertain any questions. So that's a great question. It, oh, sure. So the question was, there has been a lot of regulation of commercial growing and use of cannabis, um, but what about re in terms of re residential bylaws, like restricting where you can grow, um, maybe restrictions in terms of proximity to schools? Um, so when the provinces 
provinces and municipalities rolled out their retail bylaws, there were restrictions in terms of um, how close it can be to schools, so that's definitely a consideration. Um, and then in terms of private residence, re residences for growing, that hasn't been um, legislated in terms of bylaws, but in terms of <clears throat> things like condo bylaws, they have been. Yeah. Go ahead. Question on a point of curiosity here. In terms of Health Canada, is there a way for the public to access to know who is properly licensed and, and not? That, yes, there, that's a great question. So there are over 200 licenses that have been granted to date. So if you go onto the Health Canada website or just Google um, Health Canada cannabis license, you will come upon a page and it's a it's a table that shows the license holder, the date of grant, the type of license, and where they're located. Um, while there are over 200 licenses, there aren't necessarily the same corresponding number of license holders, distinct license holders, because one license holder, such as Canopy, might have several different licenses for their various sites, or a sale and a, and a cultivation processing license. Um, that website is updated every Friday. So if you wanna see who the new potential clients are potentially, or who the new, uh, who the new uh, license holders are, it's, it's every Friday. So every Friday, um, you know, people will tweet about it, or you can just go on the page and have it refreshed. So very that's good. a very Thank practical you. question. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, you made a, a comment about uh, CBD um, federally in the U.S., and I've had um, some individuals contact me about cross, crossing the border because they have uh, various, um, uh, one in particular has CBD, take CBD capsules for medicinal reasons. Did you indicate that that is not an issue to travel to the U.S. now? It is still an issue. So if you are taking any cannabis product, because it is federally illegal, uh, you cannot take it across the border. You can take 30, 30 gram, grams of cannabis within Canada, which is, which is a lot, um, but you can't, uh, you can't take it from Canada to the US. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, Kate Ryan from, uh, on behalf of Lanark. I'm from Smith's Falls, actually, and uh, I just wanted to invite everyone to come to Smith's Falls and tour the tweed plant there because it's unbelievable what has happened in our town. We used to have the Hershey plant. It moved to Mexico. Our town was destroyed financially. Uh, tweed has come in. They, they've tripled the size of the Hershey plant. Uh, our town rents, an apartment that used to rent for $500 a month is now $1,300 a month. We have restaurants, we've got musicians, we've got professionals. Yeah, we have, it's just transformed our town. But what's interesting, and I invite you to do, is to come, if you're driving through Smith Falls, go to the Tweed plant and do the tour. Because it'll take you maybe 40 minutes. It's very uh, instructive. It's very slick. You're, you're going to walk out of there wondering how you've ever existed or survived without cannabis in your life. <laughs> um, and I mean, the town, we've had Snoop Dogg come to our town and perform a free concert. It's just, it's, it's just unheard of. But I just want to encourage everyone, if you, if you have a moment, stop by because you'll really learn a lot about, uh, about the product and, and what it can do. Great, thank you. And I, I echo her sentiments. You should definitely, if you can, tour a facility because it just it's it's mind boggling to see the scale and just from how we grew up to where it is now, right? Um, one of my clients, is anyone in, in the Strathroy London region? So in there is a licensed producer. There's three li licensed producers in Strathroy. Um, Tilray, WeedMD, and Eve Cannabis, and Eve Cannabis is having an open house, so you can tour the facility on November the 22nd. So I can, I can help get you registered for that too. Any, any other questions? Please. Oh, why, okay. <laughs> Let, let's go there, shall we? So why a call in Namibia? So I uh, started off my career, I was born in Toronto, grew up in Etobicoke, went to high school in London, Ontario. This is all a very Southern Ontario kind of, you know, immigrant girl life. And then um, I article at McCarthy's, I was a junior at McCarthy's in Toronto. And then um, 
that was when capital markets was really, really hot and asset-backed mortgage lending, all of that sort of stuff. So I got recruited to work for a New York law firm called Sherman Sterling, specifically out of their London office. And um, so I decided to take the opportunity, so I went. And I did some really sexy deals and um, it was very exciting. And then all of a sudden the capital markets went <laughs> So uh, a lot of my colleagues were stopping to do an MBA or to take a, a sabbatical to do a, um, to travel or to do that sort of thing. And you know, I I had done the law school exchange to to Europe. So I studied in Groningen for those of you who went to Queens. Um, so I had that box ticked. But the one box I hadn't ticked as a lawyer and as a corporate lawyer um, was to do some sort of human rights law or to do some sort of you know use my legal brain to. Um, to do something to affect change for, for people. So then I thought, let me look at doing some sort of a three-month secondment somewhere. Um, so I was invited by a woman named Diane Hubbard who did a lot of um, post apart pre-apartheid and post-apartheid apartheid, uh, legislative work in South Africa and in Namibia. So she invited me to do an actual study in Namibia. I then met my husband. <laughs> um, so a three-month a three-month study ended up being several years, um, a dog, a house, a car, two kids, and partnership at a law firm doing corporate commercial law. So that's why Namibia. <laughs> You're very welcome. And anything else? I don't think there's anything more interesting than that on my resume. So. <laughs>